With 2022 coming to a close, what a great year it has been for the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast. I can't thank you enough for your support and really listening to all of the great interviews, mindset resets, meditations, and even just solo conversations. Looking back at some of the amazing conversations I had over the span of this year, One stands out for me and for all of you, it seems, and that was with Laura from Fostering.Parenting. If you have been on Instagram or TikTok, you know Laura as the woman who has brought you inside of her home and shows you what it's like to be a foster parent. What you don't often get to see in those pieces that she puts out is her personal story, how her deep passion to serve children in her community really started when she was in high school. Listen to this great, amazing interview with Laura as she brings us inside what it's like to foster children home. This was the top interview of 2022. Hey everyone, welcome to the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast. I'm your host, Danielle Van. As a cognitive behavioral therapist, life coach to women and author, I've spent my life studying and learning from the stories that make us human. It's my passion and goal to help you shift your mindset and create a lifelong revolution to help you reach your greatest potential. So often we speak about purpose in the terms of finding it the tools we need, and how to know when we are on our destined path. But what we don't speak enough about are the small, seemingly insignificant moments that speak to us and have the power to create a life revolution that not only impacts us, but impacts the lives of thousands of others we had no idea we would impact. This week, we're talking about purpose and what it means to be a parent with Laura from Foster Dot Parenting. Every parent and child has struggles at one point or another. And when this happens, we often seek resources to assist and empower ourselves. And if you've logged on to TikTok or Instagram in this last year, you've likely stumbled across one of Laura's videos where she offers such resources to parents around the globe, but especially those who are foster parents. What started as a way to fill the gap of resources during the pandemic has turned into a global advocate platform for foster children. It's also a place for teachers to learn about trauma outside of the classroom. What will likely strike you is not only Laura's purpose and mission, but how deeply mindful, grounded, self-aware, and grateful she is, and how she lives her life through a servant's heart. For the first time, a face and voice so many know is sharing her personal story and her desire for the children in her care and yours. The Get Your Life Together Girl podcast starts right now. If you have been on TikTok or Instagram, you are probably in a moment where you are watching one of these videos where you are learning about foster parenting. I will tell you, I stumbled upon a reel several, I don't know, it's probably been six or eight months ago, I guess at this point. And I thought, wow, the mission that this woman has is so impactful. I want to watch where it goes. And it's just this daily understanding of how we can be impactful, which is why I wanted to have you on today to talk to this audience, especially women that may be in a situation that they're thinking about foster parenting, or they can't have their own children, or they're just in a struggle, not sure. So tell us a little bit about who you are and we'll dive right in. Awesome. Thank you for having me. So I'm Laura. I am a foster parent here in California and yeah, I've been fostering for several years and have gone through my own kind of ups and downs and twists and turns and landed, you know, about a year ago on online, on social media, seeking out my own support but in exchange offering support to others. And it's become something I think is pretty incredible. So thank you that you mentioned that you stumbled upon one of mine, but yeah, so I've been fostering for several years now and it's, it's been an interesting experience to say the least. (laughs) It's so interesting to watch your videos because the whole content is about what happens when you want to dive into foster parenting and then what happens when you're in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. So I want to start first with your story. How did you decide that 
you were going to really jump into this mission of taking kids into your home and really wrapping your arms around them. Sure. So it's sort of strange, I think, but I was a teenager and watched this TV show called a home for the holidays where it's, you know, showing kids who are in foster care, who seek and want to be adopted, but haven't found a home yet. And it's this very kind of special you know, very Christmassy thing. And I wa- I remember watching it as a teenager. And that was sort of when I was first introduced to the idea of foster care. I didn't really know much about it, asked some questions. And the seed was officially planted at that point. And, you know, went through life, went to school, went to college. And I actually, my dad got sick when I was a young adult and ended up passing away. And I went through this whole right cycle of I was a caregiver. I needed caregiving support from my friends and it really changed me and how I approach everything in my life and what I'm doing here and how I spend my hours and being a foster parent seemed, you know, it was always in my head and it seemed to be the right thing for me. And I took it year by year, step by step, and just to see what would happen and how it would unfold. And, you know, I'm very lucky. I I met my husband who was down to at least learn more. Yeah. And we ended up, you know, signing up for an introductory. It's like a meeting you go to at the beginning. And we signed up just to see what it was all about. And we're like, let's do this. Let's, let's give it a try. We can always stop, but let's see if we can, you know, support the community in a more unique and impactful way. Mm -hmm. There's so many questions, but one thing I want to say is that moment of seeing that show really is that seed planting for purpose. And it's Mm -hmm. so powerful. Can It is. It's it's, strange to like, really like, wow, that was it. (laughs) Yeah. Like that was the moment that Mm -hmm. would be the trajectory of my entire life at this Mm -hmm. point. Not only- I remember the girl. I remember it was this 19 year old who was in college and, you know, I was in high school and thinking about college myself and had nowhere to go for Christmas. And I'm like, what? Like, I need, I need to adopt her. You know, I need to adopt someone like this, or I need to at least be a home for someone to have. And, you know, I remember it. I don't remember her name, but I definitely have the vision in my head and remember that moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's probably carried on through many different moments since then. It has. Obviously, I have a much better understanding of the situation and the context and the nuances now. But yeah, I I think about a lot and I tell everyone about this show because it did something for me. Maybe it would Mm -hmm. do something for someone else. I love those moments of purpose sneaking in without us being aware And then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden they become that trajectory. It's so beautiful. I can't imagine. (laughs) a husband saying, okay, sure. Why not? Because you don't have your own children, right? Like you don't have, no, no. And that was, and again, maybe something a little bit more different about me. I never Mm -hmm. felt, you know, called or needed to have biological children. You know, family is important to me. You know, I love my family. I do a lot with my family, but you know, what that looked like didn't need to be something very specific for me personally. Mm -hmm. And when I met my husband, he felt good about that too. Obviously, you know, I think he, he changed his mind on some things, but you know, if we could provide family and, and safety and love, even just for a short amount of time, that was still, you know, good for us. We were excited and happy to provide that, you know, to families. So for all of the people that are thinking about you know, getting into this program, because we've heard, and we've even had guests on the show who have gone through foster care, who Mm -hmm. have had really hard experiences. And the mindset a lot of times for a lot of people is that it's just hard. We, Mm -hmm. they land in situations. These kids are landing in situations that are awful. We don't see the positive side. We don't see the lures that want to show up and, you know, create these safety nets. So Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what's this process like? How do we get started? Yeah. So (laughs) it's really like learn by doing, and you kind of explore more about yourself. The more you get introduced to each, each step of the way, you know, it starts Mm -hmm. with a very, a phone call to the department of children and family services. And you attend this intro session where they walk through tons of 
steps and procedures and what to expect. And often they have, you know, a former foster youth or a current foster parent to share a little bit, which is super meaningful. And I, you know, that really like made my mind spin and think and consider. And, you know, that's also what I've been wanting to show to others. Like, Mm -hmm. this is what it looks like. Does this scare you? Does this worry you? Or are you, are you, you know, interested? Do you think that you can provide this help? And so I, you know, I try to to show others and tell others about all these small moments, right? Mm Because, you know, I think when you are helping your community and supporting a family, it's a lot of small moments that really matter. And, that's what we do every day. You know, sure. I, you know, make lunches and tuck kids in, but there's a lot of these really small nuanced moments when you're helping a family reunify and come back, keep a bond and then come back together. That's something I really want to talk about. And something that is so prevalent in your content is that you really are that stopgap, and you really are trying to literally foster these souls into going home. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of the misconception that at least in my, in my field, in my experience where people say, you know, oh no, that they're in a bad situation. They need to be taken out. And you know, how do you do that and keep yourself emotionally? Well, that's a big question. I know. Yeah. So you have to figure out what works for you. Having gone through harder experiences, you know, obviously not comparable to what these kids go through, but having, you know, some experience in my life with a hard moment, I developed, you know, my own self-care and coping skills during that time of grief and loss. And so I apply a lot of that to what I do and how I serve and support families. You know, it's a lot of living in the moment and just meeting them where they are today Mm -hmm. and being compassionate today. And, you know, stepping back and decompressing and processing and some compartmentalizing as well. And it is, it does become a skill. The first year is hard and it's very emotional. It still is emotional by the way, but (laughs) you sort of figure out what you need and what works for you. And that's, I do try to, you know, let everyone know that you can modify and change course and set your boundaries. And it can be kind of what works for you in this season of your life. That's sort of how we've approached it. After every child has returned home, we take our time to reconnect as a couple. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we hang out with our friends that don't have kids and then reconsider, right? Because you have to reconsider each time and figure out what, if we're ready for the next family, if we're well enough and strong enough to do it again. Right. It's so important that we don't have to just sort of barrel through and that we can sit and yeah. we can process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we don't want to talk about the specifics of any child that's come into your care mm-hmm. because it's not fair to the child nor to the mission that you are trying to serve. But have there been times where you have really just struggled with those children that have come in, not necessarily with the child itself, but the situation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. A lot of <laughs> my content is based on things I've messed up or struggled with. If you are an advocate for yourself as well, you can find support. There is a lot out there, you know, with support groups and community and Mm -hmm. others who can help you process and give you advice. There's definitely been, you know, kids that I've cared for that had challenging behaviors and of no fault of their own. Right. But there were certain services and in-home support and therapies that really helped guide us and teach me how to be a better caregiver and foster mother for them. And, you know, in whole help the whole family, you know, continue to move towards reunification. You know, it's so important that we always work on ourselves and try to meet the children where they're at and continue to educate ourselves and learn more, more techniques, more tools to have in our toolkit because the kids depend on us and the families depend on us. And that's really true for any family, right? Yeah. yeah, We have to have that in any family is that it's not just this blanket. Well, here we are today. We have to continue to grow and learn and show up and serve in the moment, which is what you're talking about. Yeah. And I, you know, I think if you just start with kindness and compassion Mm. and an open mind, allowing your judgments to change or your, you know, stereotypes, you maybe have believed allowing that all to change and be fluid and 
you know, being open to learn about others and what they've been going through. That's what really will make you not just a good foster parent, but I think a good human in life. Um, and you know, that's, that's what I choose to do. I, what I love too, about the content and, you know, the learnings that people have access to just by following along, whether on Instagram or TikTok, is that you really are showing how you can show up as the best self for someone who needs you. Is that the driving force every single day is just how can I be my best self and serve? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I take time for myself too, <laughs> you know, Good. you have to, or you'll burn out pretty quickly, but mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, my motto is set everyone up for success, including yourself. So what does the family need? What does the child need? What do I need? How can we all, you know, set ourselves up for success? And that might just be a mental health day where we order pizza and watch a movie together. You know, that can be something different every day. But yes, I think it's something that I'm always thinking about. I think any, any mother or yeah. parent thinks about these things and how we can get through today and you know, get through the challenges we're presented with this week. Right. What are some of the biggest challenges that you have experienced, whether even just going through the process of becoming a licensed foster parent, or even just what you experience on the day to day? What are those biggest challenges? So I think that the system, I'm not going to say is broken because that doesn't help anyone learn. Right. I think it, the system is hard to navigate and it only works if everyone on the team works. Mm -hmm. And so even if, you know, a foster parent is there and cheering them on and really advocating for things, if the therapist, attorney, and social worker are not all aligned on the path, things will go wrong. Things flip through the cracks again. You know, I hate to say that, but I have seen that happen, you know, a lot. I, I take that on me, right? So how can I learn more about the system and how things work? What are the other struggles that the professional team has? What red tape are they facing? I think this has also helped me in just lots of things with parenthood. When you're dealing with an IEP process, it's very similar. When you're seeking mental health services, you know, it's, it's a whole team effort and everyone does have to be on the same page. And so that can be hard, especially in a crisis situation, which foster care is, you know, everyone has a huge responsibility caseload task list. And so getting everyone on the same page, moving towards the same things is usually the foundational problem that I have found. Yeah. That seems huge. It seems like <laughs> a big mountain to climb. You know, I think, do you feel like that's what stops a lot of people from moving into this space and being able to serve that maybe they want to, they are curious about it, but they think, oh my gosh, I'm going to be dealing with so much and I don't know how. And then yeah. there's this child well, yeah, it's, I think it's that and the emotional side it's both right. It's I'm entering into this world that I know nothing about, you know, oftentimes foster parents are not child welfare professionals, right? So you are having to learn and teach yourself and look for your own answers. Mm -hmm. But then when you add this level of, you know, emotional attachment and fear and worry and love it can be hard to start or it can be like, well, right. maybe not. But, you know, I think I can say here all the time, like, it'll be fine. It gets better. You right. know, you do have to be a strong, you have to have a strong heart and you have to be willing to put yourself out there and take that step. You said something big, emotional attachment. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people probably also stop because they think, how will I, you know, allow this child to leave me after I've had them in my mm -hmm. care and I've loved them. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So attachment is necessary to, you know, support a child through a crisis situation mm -hmm. and, you know, and all that comes with that. So I never shy away from that, but I will say that when you get to know the family and you invest in those relationships, mm -hmm. it does make reunification or a, a move and transition easier because you have a better understanding of what's going on, what that experience will be for the child, how you can support them in that transition and support the family. And oftentimes you can hear from the child again, or the parent yeah. or get an update or continue to support them. I always offer to babysit, you know, after a child returns home or go to a birthday party or send gifts mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, it's different for each situation, but 
it is hard to right. love a child and then, you know, say goodbye, but it isn't impossible. You know, you know, people do this every day. You, you have daycare providers and teachers who are, you know, bonding and loving on our kids and our families and, you know, medical professionals, therapists. I think this is something that is more common than what I think people think about, Yeah. but so it is possible. And when you can find a community that's been through it, it does make it easier. I always go to support group. I always, you know, mm -hmm. seek out that support and kind of reminders and, you know, all of that yeah. along the way, but it is, it is okay. And it, it, you can get through it. That's such an excellent point. Something I've never thought about. I mean, obviously when we send our kids to school or in those different, you know, elements that we're not there and present, they really are loving on our kids mm -hmm. and having an attachment to them and never really thought about that. So it's very eye-opening that you mentioned that. What would you want people who are considering being a foster parent to know that maybe you did not know when you started this adventure? <laughs> I think that things change, your mind changes and, you know, you think you have it all figured out, right. And you have right. your life. A lot of people enter foster. You decide to be a foster parent after they're, you know, a little bit more settled. Maybe they have a house or a partner. You kind of know where your life is going, but things change when you see it and experience and feel it. I, I don't think you'll ever be the same again. And that's okay. I firmly believe we should always be growing and, you know, exploring things in life, but you know, you have to be comfortable with that change because that change is coming right. and you don't ever go back to who you were before. And, you know, sometimes your family and your friends and your community changes with you too, because this is just like having biological children or making a big life altering decision, you know, moving abroad, whatever it is, this is, this is it. This is one of those decisions, right? How have you been impacted? as you've moved through this, as you're talking about change and it being inevitable and, and moving through all of this, I can only imagine that that has occurred for you as well. Yeah. I think that I continue to change, but what I've seen is that, you know, there's so much more work to do. Yeah. And I, you know, my husband and I were like, well, we'll do this for a few years and just, you know, help a couple of families and see where that takes us. But I don't think that I could ever step away from this community and, you know, helping our neighbors. I, mm -hmm. there's so much to do, whether it's just being a foster parent or a, a CASA, which is another way to support, you know, kids and families in care. I, I don't think I will ever walk away from it completely. Cause like I said, once you've seen it and experienced it, you don't ever forget that. Right like I said before, there's so many misconceptions about what this is. Can you talk about the good parts, the pieces that are really positive and are impactful through your experience, through maybe other stories that you've, you know, been witness to, can you talk about the good? Yeah. I mean, kids are being put into safe homes. I mean, that is still happening, you know, at the beginning of of foster care of a situation, there's a crisis. Right. right. And, and so kids are being in, placed into safe homes and they are being loved on. And there are so many services that do exist for the kids. So I, you know, I think that is still occurring, right? I have seen the process of families getting help and kids returning to happen. I've seen it. I've seen the life cycle right. and, you know, there's a lot of changes I would still make to that whole cycle, but I can sure. tell you that there are cases where it works out and seeing a family come back together, stronger, healthier, ready is, is really, you know, empowering and interesting to see as just, you know, from an outsider, even, right. I, I think there's a lot of systems that people don't realize are happening in our community. You know, there's, places for families to go and to be supported. And there's different types of support services that do exist and they can be incredibly helpful to families who are struggling. And sure, we can talk all day about how they need to be more accessible and you know right. easier to, to get to and whatnot. But when, like I said, when the whole team has the right mindset and the services are there, you know, families can get stronger. Kids can return quickly. You know, I, 
I've had children stay with me only a couple of weeks and then return back to mom. Wow. You know, this can happen and things can improve. And I love seeing a family thrive. I follow there's, you know, lots of yes. families on TikTok and Instagram that talk about their experiences as well and how it can improve and we can end cycles. You know, th- these yeah. things can happen with help. And when you are showing up every day, is that help? And you have your team of professionals there to help. Like we can help our neighbors and help kids and their parents and their family. You have such a servant's heart. It's not, <laughs> it's not something that is, you know, it's grown, but it's very innate. And so thank you. I, and, and that's something I don't recognize, I think in my own self. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I hope that you will. <laughs> I do. I hope that you will, because that's not, like I said, it's innate, right? Because a lot of people would never make that jump from watching a movie to this is what my life path should be, you know, even if it took a long time to get there. Sure. Well, I think, you know, you all, you think about your your experiences growing up and seeing Mm -hmm. caregivers around you and helping others and helping neighbors and being philanthropic. And, you know, I always believe we should be raising our kids, you know, in service and helping Mm -hmm. others and being honest with kids about what's happening in their neighborhood, because everyone grows into an adult and has some extra time, money, resources, something to give. And we can all do something small or big to help each other. Yeah. Absolutely. One question that came to mind, and it may not be one that you want to answer, but have you had situations where you've had someone in your home and you've worked to get them back with their family and then they end up with you again? So I got, yes, it has happened. They did not come back to me. I was no longer available. I had other kids with me, which is a very painful day. Yeah, it happens. And that tells me that we are not helping these families enough. And we failed, you know, we, we failed this family to ensure that they, they had the skills, tools, resources to, to continue and thrive and, you know, live their life. So yeah, it has happened. And I mean, I remember that day I got a text from the social worker asking if I was available and I knew exactly what it was for. I did help that social worker find a family. So, but yeah, it does happen. And this is our world. And when you think about, you know, cycles and addiction and mental illness, and these things aren't, aren't being solved overnight. And I think we have to stop expecting that from families. Instead, we need longer term support that's continued and we need to all help each other. (laughs) That sounds so corny, but, but it is how we get through, you know, if you think about a time that you've, you've had, that's hard it, things don't improve in six months. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think we, we shouldn't be expecting that of everyone, you know, that was what brought the question in my mind was that you said, you know, we need to break these cycles Mm -hmm. and we are only as good as our system like you said, let's not call it broken. Let's call it in need of more resource. Yeah. Is there something that you wish you had that you could pass on that the rest of us can support you and in doing this kind of hard, but fulfilling work? I think just, you know, more people caring about Mm. what's happening. It's so easy to dismiss families in need or, you know, homeless people or, you know, people in crisis that if it's not affecting you, then I I'm, it's easy for me to, I have my own things I'm dealing with. And I think, you know, just foster families need a community, biological families need a community, kids need a community. I think if we all, you know, stop and think and ask how we can support or what's the small thing I can do, it does make a difference. I think that, you know, becoming trauma informed is a great place for people to start. There's, and that can affect, I think anyone at any point in any profession. And when we can apply a trauma lens to a situation and, you know, have compassion and understand the context, we can really connect with people and help them in a more meaningful way. I think that's like, to me, the, the baseline if, is just getting more people trauma-informed and understanding how to help people who've experienced trauma. Yeah. And it's so eye-opening too. 
other thing too is there's not a single human on this planet that has not walked through some level of trauma in their yes, life. Yes. And so if you can kind of understand what's going on, then you do have that ability to open your mind and have that lens that my life may not look like yours, but I have empathy and compassion to meet yeah. you where you are. And yeah, and everyone, big or small, something you've gone through has been through something. And yeah. you know, if you can put yourself in back in that spot and think about what you would have needed and what you wish someone had said to you or treated you at work or mm -hmm. treated you as a customer, what you know, you know, it can be applied to any context. I think it can make a really big difference. And I find that people who who have been through, you know, a harder time in their life make for the best help, right? Yes. Because they know they, mm -hmm. they're like, I've been there. Let me support you and help you through this time, right. not just today and tomorrow, next week, but continuing on. Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. <laughs> it really is because that's exactly what this whole podcast is about, right? Is when we've walked through things, if we could turn around and hold someone else's hand, mm -hmm show them the skills or I've done this. Let me, you know, help you in some way through it. It's not going to look the same, mm -hmm. but we can create a better community, a better society, a better just overall feeling amongst not only ourselves, but others that we're interacting with, which is what you're doing. Yeah. And I think you don't, you know, some people look at fo being a foster parent is like, well, I don't know anything about right. addiction or homelessness or neglect and abuse. Like you don't, you don't necessarily need to know about it or have experienced it yourself to be right. compassionate. I think it's more just being open-minded and having an open heart and being willing to learn mm -hmm. and let go of your, you know, judgments or stereotypes or whatever you have preconceived notions and just to listen and learn. You can support anyone. And right. You don't need a degree or specialized training. You need to learn along the way, but it's all accessible. I mean, that's the great thing about the internet now too, is you, yeah. <laughs> if, if you want to learn about something, you can find out about it. Right. I call it Google university, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? It's all right there. That's just, it is. Google. Yeah. And if you care about someone taking the extra moment to learn about something they're going through is super meaningful. Yeah. It is the definition of empathy and showing mm -hmm. up. Yeah, definitely. There's something that came to mind as you were talking about that. And I personally feel this way. It may not be the popular opinion, but I believe that every child, every human that comes onto this planet has not only purpose, meaning, but has the ability to show us something regardless of their age. Mm -hmm. I think so often, especially parents, you know, will say, well, you're little, so your opinion doesn't matter or whatever. And we disregard the impact that this little soul can teach us. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I can only imagine what you've <laughs> learned from these kids who've walked through the door. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I didn't realize, right. How, you know, I was very naive at the beginning, just mm -hmm. how much these situations have impact even the youngest kids. Right. And when they start to show you through play or, you know, their responses, or even just verbally, what it means to them and how they're perceiving it, it really does open your mind and make you understand and consider different points of view and how things can be perceived totally differently. You know, I think the kids that I have cared for have really shown me that we need to live today. Mm -hmm. Like what can we appreciate today? Right. And what are moments that we can laugh and giggle together and so I'm going to get like emotional, but I'm just like thinking about things. And, you know, I think that was a big shift in myself as a foster parent is I went in thinking, oh, I can help heal a family or heal a child or love, love them. And it's all going to be okay. And the reality is, is no, 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 no. We're just there to meet them where they're at today and support them through their crisis, grief, loss whatever situation they've been through and just cherish that time today and walk through those steps together. And, you know, whenever you see a, a child succeed, fail, whatever that it is, it's still like a moment to connect and cherish. And I, I don't take any of those moments for granted. You know, it is not lost on me that their, their parents are not here to see this. You know, I really cherish 
and appreciate those moments I get to spend with the kids and good and bad, hard and easy. I don't take anything for granted. And I try to always remember and share with their parents and connect with them and bond and keep them involved and as much as possible. But that's definitely what I've learned from the kids is we're just, we're here today. What can we celebrate today and just enjoy this day? Yeah. Beautiful. It's advice for every single person on this planet today. It's all you have. It's all that's guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And what starts in the morning may be very different by the time that you close your eyes at night. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And I think, you know, it's, it sounds cliche, which is why, you know, I hate to say like live today, like, you know, whatever. I just, I hate those, but it's like, yes, I have woken up on days and started a day off with in one situation and the day has ended in a very different situation. And, you know, it breaks my heart that kids and families have to live in this phase of their life. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you just take it moment by moment and celebrate and joy and grieve and, you know, spend those moments. They're meaningful. (laughs) They are. Maybe a next piece would be for so many people maybe asking the question, okay, here we are. We have this family. The whole goal is to give everyone the resources to come back together. There are times that that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And the judge may say, you know, we're not returning this child and we're going to end the parental rights, which is devastating for everybody Mm -hmm. involved. Have you been in that situation or can you give us some tools and tips for anybody who may be saying, I want to do this, but I'm actually really scared of that piece. Mm -hmm. It is scary. So I will tell everyone is it doesn't just happen. (laughs) Right. So, and I think that's what a lot of people are worried about with foster care is like, you you know, we just said you start one day and it ends differently, but like these big monumental moments typically do not just happen overnight. The court process does not work that way. So you will have a general sense of timeline of you know, how long the court is giving, when is the next hearing, what is being recommended by the department? You know, I always recommend attending court hearings when the family does not object and also communicating with the CASA, the gal, the attorney, you know, these are all the legal supports for the child so that you kind of have a sense and of where everything is going. You can prepare your heart, get yourself regulated, get your... Yeah do your own processing before you start trying to support the child as they face that day. Mm -hmm. So there is time and, you know, you, it doesn't just spring on you. If it has sprung on you, then something went wrong. Like, yeah, yeah, you, you missed something or you, you know, you got asked more questions, Right. but so you do know it's coming to some extent. Now things can get continued. It can be appealed, of course. So these things are very serious. The courts take it very seriously as they should. And, you know, I do as well. And of course the kids are, take it very seriously. This is their life Mm -hmm. and everything they've known up until that point. So, you know, just know that there's time. So you can, you have time to seek out support with your support group or your therapist or the child's therapist. You know, I always ask for a script or some advice from the kid's therapist if I'm about to deliver bad news, or I'll have them there with me as we talk about, you know, a turn in the case that might upset them. And so if you are showing up every day and you're there for the kid and advocating, then you will have already set up all of this in this, your life and the child's life. And it's, it is the reality. And this does happen. And now your support and advocacy for the child changes as you seek out permanency for them and help them get through that change and process that. How do you find the courage to move through these pieces, to stand up and talk, to be in the courtroom, to showing up at the appointment, knowing that you are the person that is about to change someone's perspective. You're not the change maker, but Mm -hmm. you are the change of perspective. That's deep courage, deep courage. Where does that come from? Hmm. I've never considered that before. I mean, I will say that I practice (laughs) and that's like 
maybe really silly and I figure out what I'm going to say. I, I at least practice my first few lines and I regulate myself. So maybe that's courage. I don't know, but I see it as that is I'm going to do the things I need to do to prepare myself. So I feel ready. And then I also always try to not do it alone. You know, whether it's a therapist, social worker, friend or husband, I, that's, you know, kind of what gives me confidence to speak and talk and say the words. And, you know, there's like little things I do just, I always have something to drink. You know, I have my water, I take my slow sips (laughs) and I, you know, pause in between things and take some deep breaths, but you know, on a very practical level, but I prepare. And I think that's what works for me. And I write it out sometimes, sometimes I'd have it on my phone and I look at real quick. And, you know, one final thought is I often say, I have something to tell you that's really important. And it's a little hard for me to say. Mm -hmm. And I find if I say that first, like and acknowledge that this is hard, it kind of like relaxes and kind of washes that away. Even when I'm speaking with adults, right. You know, I'll say like, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. (laughs) And once I say that it feels like, okay, we're all, everyone knows where I'm at and they can meet me where, where I'm at. And, you know, typically I have a trauma informed audience with child welfare professionals and everyone takes a beat and understands. And so then we just go for it. Right. (laughs) Just try our best. Well, what you just described is really giving yourself permission to be human, right? Like if I show you where I am, I tell you, then you know how to meet me and the expectations that we're all in at this moment. It's something that we all need to practice, whether we're in this situation or any other. If we can tell people what we need and what Mm -hmm. we are going through at that moment, it does. It gives everybody permission to take that deep breath. And you talked about taking the sips of water or the breath. That's a mental slowdown, right? Yes. Beautiful, (laughs) right? Like everyone, let's do this, please. And I will have drinks for the kids. Here's your water. We're all going to take a sip real quick because, you know, we have to talk, have this uncomfortable conversation and I'll name it. Right. And I'll say what it is and, or at least give permission. This might be like good news or bad news. I don't know, Right. but here's the news and we'll kind of put it out there and yeah, I guess it's courage, but I just find it being prepared. And yeah, I like how you, how you phrased it as well. (laughs) Well, courage really is doing the hard thing, right? Mm -hmm. Even if we're not prepared, even if it's uncomfortable, and even if it may impact others in a way that we are not intentional about that's courage. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you do every day. And it's very beautiful. You talked about the practicing, which is what is on Instagram and what is, is. on TikTok. I'm Welcome serious. to my practice sessions. <laughs> I love it. Seriously, if you have not seen any of these reels, any of these videos, any of these conversations, <laughs> log onto your phone, not right now, not during the conversation <laughs> that we're having, but after and watch these videos, how did you move from what you're doing to I'm going to show and teach other people? how to do this? Well, COVID happened ah. and I lost a ton of my own support. And I was very fearful for my community of foster parents at large. Like, how are they getting through if I'm, you know, we're right. all struggling. You know, I went online. I tried to find creators or videos or whatever, like, so I could like mm-hmm. feel something. And there's a really a lot of great content what I, what I felt was missing was sort of like reenactments or helping me through certain moments, because just because the pandemics happened, didn't mean suddenly foster care paused, right? Right. We were still dealing with the courts, the visits, the uncomfortable situations. And, you know, it was a lot to deal with with, in a very isolated way. Right. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll make something, (laughs) maybe someone will benefit. And now I'll feel like, okay, well, all of my stress or anxiety, this is something positive to come out of it. Because a lot of the moments I share, I have practiced, I have been through, I have messed up. I want others to, you know, at least see another consideration. They can take what I do. They can change what I do or be like, this would never work for me, which is also fine. And so it was really just, I'll, put it out there and maybe it'll help someone get through 
these like very nuanced situations. And then, you know, as it's grown, a lot of feedback has come in just that these situations and these scripts and reenactments can be applied to many other situations. A lot of teachers follow me and talk a lot about helping, you know, their students who've experienced trauma, how, you know, it's touched a lot of different people. And so I'm, I'm happy to share. <laughs> like yeah. I said, it's, it's somewhat therapeutic for me too. A lot of times you'll post something and I think, Oh, I need to send that to my client. She's having this struggle and it's <sighs> not about foster care, but I know that this is the situation that's happening. So I'm going to send this off. Thank but you. <laughs> the truth though, is that you're really impacting everybody across the board. You know, how can we show up and be our best self for people who need us at this moment? Mm-hmm. And yeah. And for me, it's hard for me to think on my feet and, you know, it, it's hard to know in, in the moment what to do or say. And so right. I'm hoping, you know, some of these situations could help you when you do have to think on your feet, you might recall just a snippet or just a small bit that can, you can try in the moment and see what happens. Did you ever imagine that it would blow up the way that it has? <laughs> <laughs> no, my first video I made on TikTok I sent it to my friend who's a creator on Instagram and she helps me all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, what do you think about this? So she gave me some feedback, which was very helpful. And I was planning to redo it the next day, but then I woke up and it had millions of views. Oh, wow. I was like, okay, well, I'm <laughs> going to leave not, that alone. <laughs> I'm going to leave it alone. There's lots of problems with it, but clearly like it resonated. So no, I had no idea that people would care. And I don't know, I feel pretty silly recording them. I there are no children in my videos. You know, I, I don't record them when kids are home because I did that once. And the child from the other room was like, who are you talking to? What's wrong? (laughs) (laughs) I can't do this. So there's no kids. It's just me being silly, talking to myself. The neighbors probably get confused too, but, (laughs) but yeah, I keep going because people seem to learn something. And like I said, I, it's helpful for me too, to potentially revisit something I'm dealing with and refocus myself or remind myself like, okay, this is, this is how we need to lead with compassion, even though you are stressed or tired or whatever. Mm -hmm. I see it as a personal journal to yourself and then to others. And I've always believed that the people that go through hard moments are our best leaders. And so when I see it, I think, okay, that's an experience. And what can we take away from it? And I know that not everybody is watching the content that way, but Mm -hmm. know that there are people that you're impacting and watching you go through these moments and, and saying, wow, okay, that can be applied to everything. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, not the intention. And I would agree. It's an interesting, I've never thought of it in that way, but it, it definitely is. It is these moments I've encountered or someone close to me who I've worked with you know, I change things, right. To make it right different than, you know, specific things my kids have been going through, but these moments that we've, I've walked through, it is, it does feel good to get it out. So people can kind of see what I have dealt with and what I've been doing, you know, these years when we've all been locked away in our houses, this is what's still been going on and what we're all experiencing as foster parents. And more so right? Because we've Mm -hmm. seen such a mass uptick of mental health Mm -hmm. issues of families breaking apart and then financial situations not being there for support. And there's been a lot more heaviness in our world, obviously. Absolutely. And we are finding more kids entering the system than ever Mm -hmm. before and, and not having the resources and not having enough foster parents. And yes, that's a huge problem. It's been, as you can imagine during COVID people weren't necessarily running to, to be a foster parent. There's a lot of fear about, you know, kids coming in who are sick or may, you know, be around someone who is, and a lot of people quit, which is totally fine. You know, it it became too stressful. The, the demands on foster parents increased right? and the expectations changed of what we were responsible for, you know, mostly the visits, you know, Just for people who don't know, kids in foster care still see their families, assuming it's safe. And these visits typically happen outside the home and are monitored by a court approved monitor, not the foster parent. Usually now all the visits went virtual became video Mm. and 
and this is still like lingered around. It's not like we're back to normal. So we, we now we're forcing kids to sit on video cameras with someone they love that they couldn't go see, touch, feel, hug, whatever. And doing this, it's just totally, it was, it was a lot. It became a huge strain. And I think a lot of people were like, I'm, I'm done or I'm pausing for now. So anyways, mm-hmm. kids continue to still need support from the system. And sadly, in many cities, there are kids sitting and sleeping in conference rooms and hotels because there just aren't homes for, for kids. And it's devastating and infuriating, right? right. But that's, that's what's happened. And it's continuing to happen in every major city, you know, foster parents are being asked to take in more and more kids. Kids are sleeping on couches, on air mattresses. We're squeeze, you know, squeezing our resources. And this is everyone, you know, social workers, everyone, but I only speak to my experiences, but it's hard. And so we really do need good homes who are open to fostering with reunification as the goal you know, lots of people want to adopt from foster care, which is really great and needed, but we also very much need just someone to kind of stand there and help the family in this kind of crisis time. Mm -hmm. I call someone like you guidepost. I feel that we have people on this planet that are really here to show up, show us as an example and to guide those who just need that in that moment. So maybe it started with just one child, but it has definitely become mm-hmm. a massive movement for sure. Mm-hmm. And so I thank you for showing up in that way. Yeah, no, thank you yeah. for caring. And, yeah. you know, I I'm so grateful for people who's come along the journey and who engage with child welfare and are at least open to hearing these stories and seeing these experiences. Cause I think you can take a small, a bit of that, plant some type of seed to help right. be a little bit more compassionate to our neighbors and people in our lives that need help in the moment. And, you know, maybe you won't become a foster parent, but maybe you'll take a pause and spend a little extra time helping, you know, a family, you know, about, or you've seen, or, right. you know, are there maybe a handful of tips that you can pass on that do apply to every single you know, mother or foster home, anybody, right. That's Mm -hmm. out there that you feel are some of the best things that you have learned. Yeah. I think that there's a couple things. So for one, don't be afraid to start. Don't be afraid to start and see, just see, Mm -hmm. you know, if there's an idea or like a, some type of small desire or thought or passion, you know, don't be afraid to start and just start the exploration and just Mm -hmm. see if it might be the right time. Everyone's like, well, when they're facing big decisions or jumping into something new, it's like, well, the timing's not right. The timing's not right. Right. I always recommend just start and see, just see Mm -hmm. if the timing is actually not right. And kind of start that, you know, it's your life. You can stop anything you want, (laughs) you know, pivot. And I think with that, just you know, making sure you're spending the time into your like social network of support, making those efforts to check in on your friends and family and cultivating that your support network. Right. And that might just be people on the internet that you've connected with, you know, online communities and making sure you're spending the time because you never know when you will need help or someone within that community needs help. And if you're not asking and checking in, there's no give and get. And, you know, we, we all got to do this together. And so really spending the time on your group of friends and family and colleagues. And then I think the last thing is just reminding yourself every day that the small moments count Mm -hmm. and, you know, a small act of compassion and, you know, a small donation or a small thank you, uh, writing a letter to someone's boss that you had a great experience with, you know, like these little tiny moments right. to not overlook them. You know, oftentimes they take just a few seconds or minutes out of our day, but those moments still matter. And we right. need more of those moments. Wow. We all could use that. And I really believe whatever you put out there, you, you know, will get returned. And I think everyone advocacy in today's world is feels so big, right. Mm -hmm. With social media and everything happening. And I think we've lost track a little bit of just being compassionate or picking up the phone or sending a text or 
doing a small thing because those moments really do matter. You know, throughout this conversation, we've talked about these tiny moments that really yeah. kind of impact us. And you never know, like something you do for someone could, could change everything. Yeah, absolutely. And you may not even realize the impact that you are creating in that moment, right? That's what's so important. And, you know, being in a space where you're creating and you're doing and this kind of platform or Instagram or TikTok or whatever, I can tell you as someone who does similar things, you know, you always wonder, is somebody paying attention? Is someone listening? <laughs> is it making an impact? Am I doing this? Am I doing, mm -hmm. you know, just know that people are watching and listening and you are making an impact. You may not hear it as much as you should, but <laughs> well, thank you, you know, yeah, I mean, I appreciate are. that you as well. I mean, I think we, we all play our part, right. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate your words and I hope, you know, as well, like every little thing that we can give can really change something for someone else. Yeah. 1% better every day. Right. That's all I like that 1% <laughs> better. That's all. doesn't have to be a hundred percent better. Maybe you don't have a hundred percent to give that day. Yeah, one definitely not every day. Yeah. <laughs> not every yeah. day. No, it's yeah. true. It's true. Is there something you want everyone to know that you wish that they new? I think in terms of, you know, the work I do about foster parents, I, you know, foster parents are not saints, angels, gods, or perfect humans. We're all just regular people who are to your point, showing up and giving what we can. And so, you know, I think a lot of people sit back and you're like, I could never do that. That's not within me, but we're all just regular people figuring it out and not not perfect and just always trying to improve and do what we can in that moment or in that day, even right. if it's 1%, even if it's 1%, <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. And I want to have you give everyone kind of a, an understanding of where they can find you. And you have some great downloads that are free, and then you have a great system that they can support you as well. So mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about that before we wrap up with your final three? Yeah. So I'm on TikTok and Instagram, foster.parenting can kind of, all my content is ad free and you can take what you need. And I also, you know, if people are wanting additional support. I offer free one-on-one -on -one chats for foster parents. And then I also, you know, offer coaching for anyone who's related to child welfare or interested in fostering, but yes, I have resources, templates, mm -hmm. you know, libraries of things you can work through and learn about exactly what you're looking for. And yes, I do have a patron where people can for as little as a dollar a month, support the work I do and get a little extra content as well. You had one video. I will tell you that got me in trouble. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I was standing in the kitchen. And I was like, what are we going to make for dinner tonight? And it was the, the one that you had with the kids being able to pick what they the were menu. going to have the menu. <laughs> right. And my son who's nine was like, um, really, we don't have a menu. I'm like, I make two different meals every night for this crew. Are you kidding me? This family of five. And I was like, all right. So I printed it out and I was like, you can do what you want, but it has to be in the refrigerator. <laughs> I <love laughs> they got that. me in trouble. <laughs> I, I mean, it. I think, yeah, I got a lot, a lot of hot and cold responses to that. It, it works for us. I make I different it. meals. My husband eats what I make for us, mm -hmm. but I do you typically make different meals for each child because, you know, pick and choose our, our battles. Right. And, and it was not a battle that I cared to fight. Right. No, it was especially perfect. food, which is so emotional and sensitive and, and meaningful. Mm -hmm. And everybody coming from different backgrounds. Right. And yes. yeah, what you're used to and what you're not, but yeah, I make two different meals every single night, period just because we have different ways of, of course, eating in our I think it happens in more households than people will acknowledge. Well, exactly. And I'm like, <laughs> really, you want a menu? Okay, fine. I said, I'm speaking to her. I'm going to tell her that I got in trouble. And he was like, go ahead. Cause I want the menu. <laughs> I, I loved mean, it. <laughs> you know, it helps everyone. It's a visual there's, a, there's choice. You're empowering, you know, there's yeah. many different benefits. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. We'll definitely go and follow, look at all of the different options and content. As you know, 
we end this podcast the same way because that's what people have come to expect. And oddly enough, it's generally what people write in most about. We're the <laughs> last three. So I'll leave it to you as to, do you want to talk about the three things that you're most grateful for or things that you wish people knew? You kind of already went through that. You know, mm-hmm. what are your three things that you want to leave the women that listen to this podcast with? Sure. So maybe I'll do the gratitude. Okay. That's just who I am. Yes. (laughs) So I am grateful first for everyone that has followed me on my journey. And because I learn a lot from everyone who has contributed and said, you know, something and helped me along my way or corrected me even. So I'm grateful for all of the, the internet strangers, as I call them who have joined in and also, you know, helped others and formed a community. And I, a day does not go by where I'm not saying, oh my goodness, I'm so grateful. These people are here. And I'm also grateful for just the opportunity to be a foster parent. And I'm, there is some privilege involved with being able to commit the time, energy resources to it. And I am grateful Mm -hmm. that I am in a place where I can serve in that way and I can help. And I can, you know, still have the, the energy to get up every day and do this. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for my core people too. As I said earlier, my community, it's, I have a few very close friends and family who have been able to support all the different twists and turns my life has taken, even through my own grief and loss as a young adult. And now I, I would not be who I am today for the people within my group Mm -hmm. and their incredible, you know, friends and, you know, foster aunts and foster grandmas Mm -hmm. to all the kids within my care. And I am just amazed at the outpouring of support they've been able to give me. Beautiful three. I love that you said, I'll start with the gratitude because that's who I am. And that is who you are. (laughs) It's, It's very evident. And thank you for shining your light for educating others, how to be of service. And as you said, if anybody's curious, not only is the video content, they can get in contact with you and learn Mm -hmm. more. We need more people who show up for children. And these are children that need somebody more than ever. And you're making an impact. And everyone can do something. And I'm more than happy to, to, I, you know, speak with people and help you figure out how you can help, but yes. And thank you for making this whole, you know, hour about foster care, because it's not something a lot of people want to talk about and it's happening in our communities and in your neighborhoods. And so thank you for just bringing awareness to it. It's very meaningful. I just want everyone to have the same opportunity to heal, to be seen Mm -hmm. and to be heard. And if we can do that when they are children, or like you said, when we are in crisis, it plays such a massive impact over the span of our life. It does. Mm -hmm. And so that's, what's so important, you know, just show up, be your best self again, 1%. That's all we need. I like it. Thank you so much for talking with me. A few essential takeaways Laura shared are that each of us has a purpose and the ability to serve when we stay present and focused. We also have the power to make an impact. And in the end, all we have is today. We must live in these moments and give all that we can to make it the best it can be, not only for ourselves, but also for those who need our support, love, and our ability to see them in their most significant moments of need. If you would like to dive deeper into foster parenting or learn more from Laura's vast resources for parents, you can visit her website at www.fosterparentpartner.com or follow her on TikTok and Instagram at foster.parenting. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Be sure to tune in each Tuesday when a new episode of the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast is released. If you're looking for daily inspiration, join the growing community at Get Your Life Together Girl on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, or you can visit GetYourLifeTogetherGirl.com for additional videos, blogs, and upcoming events. Thank you for listening and being a valuable part of this community. Until next time, be kind to yourself and others.